If you think landscape architecture, you might conjure gardens or parks. But in a rapidly changing climate fueled by this summer's intense heat, flooding, fires, and now hurricanes, architect and designer Kate Orff is helping redefine her field and push us all toward new climate adaptation solutions. Jeffrey Brown has the story for our arts and culture series, Canvas. We're here in Tottenville, which was known as the town that the oyster built. A walk on the shore of Staten Island, New York, with landscape architect Kate Orff. But this is no day at the beach, and despite the gentle lapping of water on a hot summer morning, this is anything but a healthy coastline. In 2012, this area was overwhelmed by the storm surge caused by Hurricane Sandy, which caused widespread flooding in many parts of New York City. More than half of the 43 people killed were on Staten Island, and the destruction extended well inland. Eleven years later, Kate Orff is watching the final stages of an experiment she hopes can point the way towards a healthier ecosystem and mitigate future disasters. It's called living breakwaters. The breakwaters are kind of a strategy about kind of helping to slow the water, helping to clean the water, helping to replenish this incredibly eroded shoreline, actually reverse erosion, and then start to rebuild this kind of critical three-dimensional mosaic of subtidal and intertidal rocky kind of marine ecosystem that we have literally decimated in the New York Harbor. It's down to about 1% of its former extents. Orff is founder of the design firm Scape, based in Lower Manhattan. She's a leading voice in her field, pushing efforts to address the climate crisis and its many impacts. She was the first landscape architect to receive a MacArthur Genius Award directs the urban design program at Columbia University, and this year was named to the Time 100 of the most influential people in the world. One mantra, adapting to a changing climate, requires adapting her own profession. It requires rethinking our, our training, our perspective, our assumptions about what is, what is land, what is water, what is engineering, what is art. I think every profession today is now your your, your existing profession plus climate emergency. You use the term climate adaptation, mm. clearly behind a lot of what you're after. What does climate adaptation mean? Climate adaptation in the built environment means, you know, looking with clear-eyed view at what we have built now and where we have built and how can we, you know, knowing that all of these sort of factors are in flux what can we do to look at that built environment in a synthetic and holistic way and try to make adaptations to make us safer in the future? And a lot of times, you know, the answers are murky. Like the waters of Raritan Bay, where the living breakwaters are being constructed, with $107 million in funding by New York State and the federal government. The idea, build a set of barriers that will hold back water with eight partially submerged structures of stone and concrete. A nonprofit called the Billion Oyster Project will seed the structures with oyster larvae, eventually recreating an oyster reef, a return to an earlier era when oysters were an enormous part of New York's economy and natural ecosystem. The oyster as an answer to a lot of these problems? You know, this would have been a thriving salt marsh. You would have had oyster reefs covering the bay. Which would have prevented erosion. Right, and yeah. these intact landscape systems protect and sustain us, full stop. And so the oyster is a keystone of that landscape. And the reason is it is, you know, it kind of can create reefs, it can build up, it can, you know, form wave attenuating reefs. It's food for migrating uh, birds. It creates shallow waters for the horseshoe crab. It kind of sets into motion these more sort of shallow intertidal protective landscapes. So the idea is millions or a billion oysters create a new ecosystem. Right, and, and we have to start. So the oyster is the first step. It's not the answer, but it is a, a first step. It's a step that's catching on, including a similar smaller project highlighted on the NewsHour recently underway in Louisiana. Orff herself is working at sites around the country and more and more the globe, 
mostly small-scale to client-driven projects. But she wants to work and wants us to think bigger. A Mississippi River National Park, for example. Bold, transformative ideas for the American landscape. If all of this is so obvious, why isn't it the norm? I mean, what, are the, what are the barriers? <laughs> and the barriers are many, right? These big projects that we need to conceive of that may cross state boundaries, they may cross watersheds, they certainly will cross city boundaries. They're really more at a regional scale, mm -hmm. kind of don't really have a, 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 an owner, if you will, or a way to kind of like nest into the system. What's your job in, in making us see it differently? Right, well, I think so much of the you know, rhetoric around climate change is you can't do that, or you can't do this, you can't drive this way, you can't put your house on this coastline. And then but, people say... And then people react. Yeah. But I really see there to be this an incredibly beautiful, rich, textured, environmental future that, that we should be running towards. When you talk about changing the way landscape architecture or other parts of mm -hmm. the design world are, are done, you include activism. That's right. We can't just be passively accepting and assuming, you know, what's you know what's coming on the plate is not what needs to be done. We need to be defining the projects that are happening or that are coming our way. Um, mm. And so, you mean this, you you want to be putting the projects forward and yes. the designs forward rather than <laughs> I want to be waiting. suggesting what needs to happen. Another part of her practice: education at all levels. The project engages schools on Staten Island to get young students involved. Knowledge and ownership, she believes, are fundamental to any future change. There's a sense of despair, frankly. There's a sense of I'm inheriting a world that I did not make and that I am now responsible for. And I, I just feel like it's too much of a cop-out to say to the next generation, oh, you know, you're going to be the solvers. That's really not fair. I really want to feel like they, you know, that we are making a huge difference and that we're at least setting a pathway that, that these students feel like they can, they can see themselves on. Her hope, one day soon, that will include enjoying a healthy and inviting beach near home. Completion of the living breakwaters is expected by the end of next year. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown on Staten Island, New York.